Like a tropical rainforest, the undersea world is lush with its colourful marine life and intricate formations. The ecosystem where corals form the structure and provide shelter for the marine habitat living in it is called the coral reefs. They are most commonly found at shallow depths in tropical waters and are one of the most biologically diverse ecosystems on Earth. In the coral reef ecosystem, you find other animals and plants living together. There are fish, there are invertebrates other than corals. There are what we call animals like mollusks, shells, crustaceans like the shrimps and prawns and lobsters. We have uh, minute organisms, eh? microorganisms, which you hardly uh, can see them easily with your naked eyes, but uh, they all are in the reef ecosystem. The most important reef building organisms are corals. Corals are often mistaken for a rock or a plant, although they actually consist of tiny spineless animals called coral polyps. These polyps have a symbiotic relationship with the algae called zooxanthellae. It is that zooxanthellae that helps coral to not only produce food, you know, but also help coral to produce the skeleton. The symbiotic relationship between corals and zooxanthellae breaks down when corals become physically stressed. Many factors can cause stress to corals, but one of the major causes is temperature change. Corals are sensitive to temperature change, and they are actually able to grow well, reproduce only within a narrow range of temperature. Corals are also sensitive to salinity, the salt level or salt content in the water. But uh, there are many things like, you know, there are diseases of corals, which not many people highlighted. There are corals that bleach. When they become stressed, they are actually prone to bleaching. They expel zooxanthellae. That is what that causes the pigmentation in the corals. So you can tell if the coral is not healthy when it is a bit pale or it is a bit whitish or, you know, uh, yellowish, it's not the normal, brilliant, bright colour. When bleaching occurs, the coral will become unhealthy and may eventually die. The latest National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Coral Reef Watch Outlook shows that the most severe thermal stress regions are the Southern Pacific Ocean areas. Malaysia waters are currently under the watch alert status. However, a few dive sites on the east coast of Peninsular Malaysia have remained closed since July last year. Professor Dr. Rizwan says the authorities deem closing the dive sites will allow the corals to recover. I think uh, they have uh, good reasons why they didn't want it to close, so that it gives time for coral to actually uh, recuperate if they have gone through that stress state or they may want to actually uh, prevent divers to come in and cause more damage onto the reefs. So they have reasons. As long as their uh, move uh, to close the reef is not going to be affecting other people, especially the livelihood of people who are dependent on the reef. Some parties, though, doubt if the closures were necessary. My opinion really is that there hasn't been any need to close the dive sites. The, the dive site closures have been um, a reaction without actually follow, without studying what's needed to be really done. I don't think divers have got any influence whatsoever on the recent events, the coral bleaching, or the, which is really caused by the water being hotter than it should be, so it's global warming. And I don't really think it's going to make any difference closing dive sites at all. There's no evidence that says that by closing dive sites it's going to change anything that's, that's already happened. Many dive operators claim that the announcement has caused cancellations on the resource bookings because travellers assume it was a blanket closure. Some years, more 30%, 40% to cancel because they have a, they after they read the newspaper. We don't know what our bookings would have been, but I know certainly speaking to the other operators, I think their bookings were definitely down on the corresponding periods last year and the year before. 
A dive at Chek Isa, an area in Pulau Redang where the authorities closed down, found that a healthy amount of marine life still thriving there. As evident in the dives that we made in the last two days, we have seen almost a 95% recovery of the corals. Those that died have already been covered with algae and, and it's been, it's, it, you can see the encrustation on it. And that one, we cannot do much about it. That, that is nature. But what we can do about it is not issue surprise dive sites closure that would affect the whole dive industry in Malaysia. Divers realise though, that like other diving sites all over the world, Pulau Redang's marine life is not as flourished as it was a decade ago. I think Redang generally is better than most areas in the globe, that there is some healthy reef left <laughs> and there is some healthy marine life left. However, like everywhere in the world, it's not as good as it was five, ten years ago. If you'd have come here, I mean I wasn't here, but if you'd have come here ten years ago, um, you would have seen a very healthy number of sharks, a very healthy number of corals, everything would have been in abundance. Uh, for one, I've seen a sharp decline in the number of sharks, especially in the dive site called Machante, where I used to see black and white tip reef sharks swimming around. They also question marine parks enforcement on conserving the coral reefs. What enforcement? I don't see any enforcement at all. Sometimes I wonder what they do with the five ringgit conservation fee that we pay upon coming into the marine parks because there are people who still fish around the, 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 the islands and although there are rules in place, who actually observes them? I think the right legislation's in place, but I don't think there's been enough done in the marine parks to enforce it. We, whether it's a financial thing or whether it's just the resources, or what, I'm not sure, but I don't see very much being done to actually protect the marine parks in terms of patrol boats, stopping fishing going on, stopping people doing things that they shouldn't be doing. The apparent illegal fishing around the coral reefs areas also proves the lack of awareness on marine life conservation among the locals. I see fishing boats and fishing activities every single day here. The locals will tell you and they'll tell everyone else that they're allowed to fish here. My understanding is that no one can fish within two miles of low tide um, of any of the islands within the marine park. Marine conservationists agree that education is key to ensure the survival of coral reefs in the future. It's got to be education. It has to be a, it has to be a two um, sided thing. I mean, you, you can only do so much if you like wielding the stick to sort of force them into something. You've got to give them the carrot as well. And, and you've got to educate them and you've got to help them. You've got to get the communities involved in saving what's around them. And, and that's probably the big thing that the politicians have to do is get policies in place that help the local communities manage their own resources. I think uh, it is not just enforcement or surveillance. It is more to create awareness that they are in the park and people should take care of the resources. So I think they have made a substantial improvement in terms of uh, creating awareness. The whole purpose is actually to conserve the biodiversity, the heritage, you know, natural heritage of uh, our country for the benefits of everyone. Despite dire threats the coral reefs are facing, there are some active conservation efforts going on worldwide now. In Pulau, for example, they ban shark fishing entirely. Now, it's a very small country, which covers a quite a big geographical area, difficult for them to patrol it, but they, they have actually tried to enforce it. And I'm told that shark sightings have gone up amazingly just within a 12-month period. And that's just because the waters are now, now protected. I believe Hawaii is bringing the same policy and that's going to be the first United States um, area to bring it in um, very shortly. What we need is a few more countries doing the same thing. The Maldives, I think, have done a great job over the last 12 months in trying to promote a lot of the, the environmental impacts by holding the cabinet meetings underwater and this sort of thing. So there's a lot of good initiatives going on to, to educate people and make them aware, but we need more. And Malaysia is in a, a, a position where it could do an awful lot more. Well, uh, you don't have to go very far. Now in the region, we have uh, one uh, very big global initiative called Coral Triangle Initiative. And uh, Malaysia 
Indonesia, Philippines, Papua New Guinea, Timor Leste, and also Solomon Island. These are countries we call coral triangle countries. The coral triangle means this is the center of biodiversity for corals in the world. The coral triangle is home to over 75% of the known coral species and over one third of the world's coral reefs. So there is this initiative, actually a, a pledge by all the government, the presidents and the prime minister of the countries to actually uh, work together towards managing the ecosystem jointly, create awareness about the importance of the ecosystem, try to actually protect whatever endangered species you see in this area so that they are able to continue to be around. And then uh, we know about the impact of climate change. We must know how do we actually mitigate or actually adapt to this climate change, especially in the coral triangle, because so many people are dependent on the reef ecosystem. So, hopefully global efforts such as the Coral Triangle Initiative will help ensure concrete measures are taken to alleviate threats to coral reefs and restore the underwater tropical rainforest to its grandeur for generations to come.